Welcome to Hearthstone Deck Tech Season 2, Episode 6, where we're talking Token Druid with Asmodeus. What's up, everyone? Welcome to a new episode of Hearthstone Deck Tech. Today, I have a special guest. I know the past few weeks we've talked about uh, high legend finishers. Um, you know, we, we talked with guys like Meaty and So Legit, and we talked about people who focus on the wild format, like guys like Danny Donuts and uh, James Corbett. But today, I have a very special guest, um, and his name is Asmodeus. The reason why I picked Asmodeus for the stream today is because he is a huge, huge contributor. Um, for educational content for for Hearthstone as well as other games, um, and I really really respect what he's provided for the community uh, over the many years. And he was one of the first few players I think who really understood that Mechathune Priest was actually pretty good deck, like a very very strong deck. And even though a lot of popular websites um, uh, would write off the the archetype, I think. Uh, you know, he had a, he has a good head on his shoulders, and he saw the light. And, you know, since I like to play Mechathun Priest, I thought, you know what? This guy, me and him, we definitely see things the same way. So, uh, Asmodeus, it's a pleasure to have you. How are you doing? Hi, I'm great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem, man. Hey, can you just tell the listeners at home a little bit about yourself, like your history with Hearthstone and competitive gaming in general? Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. So uh, my history with Hearthstone is I basically started playing after seeing Kriparian and other people in beta. I was doing League of Legends on YouTube at the time, uh, but my computer was like an old laptop that could only handle recording like much less demanding games. So mm -hmm. I wanted to get into Hearthstone and one of my viewers on YouTube gave me a beta key. And that's when I started playing Hearthstone. And since then, I've been like on and off playing it. Uh, but whenever I play it, then I usually tend to make uh, educational content and occasional uh, funny video on YouTube. You know, I, I noticed that you um, your YouTube channel also covers games like uh, Path Path to Exile, right? Um, yeah, pa Path of Exile. Um, League, I you play, you stream for, League, right? Yeah, also League of Legends. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what what got you into creating gaming content? What was the first game that got you into that kind of stuff? Well, in the past, when like I used to play World of Warcraft, and I always liked the the videos that people made, like all the PvP videos and things like that. I always liked that. It was always like a, something that I thought I want to do. That I want to just play a game, and then something cool happens, and then I want to share it. That yeah. that seemed like a great thing to do. Uh, and then I realized that actually I'm pretty good at explaining things and that started with StarCraft actually. I also played StarCraft 2 and uh, I had some friends ask me like how the hell do you climb the ladder or, like we played so much longer than you because I, I got into StarCraft 2 really late actually like after like uh, maybe a year or two after the uh, Wings of Liberty StarCraft 2 was released mm -hmm. but I climbed really quickly to Masters. And, uh, and people were like freaked out. So I like privately coached some people and I realized that I can actually do that as well. I right? like coaching people, sharing my knowledge about the game because even though I, did, I wasn't the greatest player, I could explain it uh, to, to help other people, right? And that's actually my focus in Hearthstone as well, right? Like sometimes, some months, like I would coach more hours than actually play Hearthstone as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I on that on that note, um, many many expansions ago. I want to say maybe the Grand Tournament. I don't I don't really know how old this was, mm -hmm. but you made a ebook which was a fundamental guide on how beginners should approach Hearthstone, and it is a very mm -hmm. extensive and exhaustive learning tool. Like it has everything from like legendaries that you should craft, um, how you can earn early gold when you first start picking up the game, like through the those hidden quests, as well as explaining fundamental principles and mechanics that I think many new players kind of lose, like, you know, tempo versus value, uh, playing on curve, and different things. And it's actually one of the best pieces of Hearthstone content 
out there and you know i'll have a yeah, link to you. it in the in the podcast show notes mm -hmm. so you guys can definitely download that I, it's a little outdated because we've had you know years of expansions after but you know the yep. same principles definitely hold true and um you know i you know for new players or any players who are are struggling to to make the climb to just to get the ladder i definitely recommend uh checking out that ebook it's pretty amazing um you know why did you decide to make that? Like, it's extensive. It's like 100 plus pages, man. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I decided and, and like I just released it for free to everyone on Reddit and it became like a super high upvoted post, like one of the highest upvoted posts on the Harston subreddit. Uh, because there was, there was just nothing like that, right? I was writing guides for, for a couple of Harston websites. Mm -hmm. And so I had a lot of this knowledge already like verbalized and accumulated. So I had a place to start with it, right? And uh, I thought like it's a fairly good format for that to, to write an ebook about that because you can divide it into chapters. Someone can just go into the chapter that they want. And uh, basically I knew how to explain it. It was just a matter of put, sitting and putting it down. And I did it over like a really long week because I, I did pretty much just that for a week straight. And uh, and managed to assemble the entire ebook. It's like because it also has like deck lists yeah. uh, for like basic decks and things like that. So it's like a hundred page long uh, document together. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, I just yeah, and I did it. And then I said, uh, hey, yeah, this is the ebook. Uh, it's free. If you wanna, uh, you know, learn, you can use that. You can share it with new players and so on. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's incredible. It even has like deck list strategies for the solo player content, which I think is mm -hmm. like really, really cool. And it's just, it's really, it's, it's a sad thing that no one else took up that helm, you know, to help you continue to update that guide. Because really, I, it's a, up until the point, you know, where it stopped, it is a one stop, mm -hmm. you know, one stop solution for anything you would need as a starting player for Hearthstone. Um, I think it's yeah, pretty, yeah, exactly. Pretty amazing. Yeah, um, right. You know, in your own mm -hmm. competitive nature with the game of Hearthstone, what were some of your biggest accomplishments in your mind? Like, was it a top legend finish or or, or any notable uh, goals or standards that you hit in the game that you are proud of? So, so basically, I did uh, things like I hit like 12-0 in arena. I got a few high legend finishes. I think the highest was like rank 14. Uh, but I, I really care more about like the coaching results that I got and helping other people because like there are plenty of people who did uh, you know very good in arena who got uh, high legend finishes. But the thing that I'm proudest of is like when I get that screenshot on Skype from someone I coach. Hey, I hit the legend. You know, wow, thank you for helping or whatever. That's like that's the that's the best feeling. That's the best thing. How often do you coach? Uh, well, I have a few students that I have uh, since a really long time ago that we just regularly meet uh, like every week or so. Mm -hmm. And then uh, just a few times a week, depending on what time of the uh, season it is, right? Whether I made recently some content or not about Hearthstone. The more content I make about Hearthstone, the, the more people are like, oh, wait. I can actually contact this guy here. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's pretty crazy too. Like, cause you, I know you make a lot of other content that's not Hearthstone content. I, I feel like the Hearthstone content is like, you know, that's a side thing, like a third or fourth priority on your list of other stuff that you already make, which is, which is amazing. You know what I mean? Like, um, what do you, for yeah, you play, have, or go ahead, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I actually have like, every now and then people will contact me to coach me in other games than Hearthstone. Wow. As well, right? to, do you play Do you play Dota? Yeah. Dota 2? Nope. No, I don't play Dota 2. Oh, man. I did try it. I did try it. I didn't like how clunky the character mm. movement is. Like, compared to League of Legends, mm. even though Dota might be, like, a more interesting game, I didn't like the controls. Like, the character seems to move after, like, a little bit of delay. It has, yeah. like, a momentum that... Uh, yeah, they have a turning, uh, like, they have a turning point. Each character has a turning radius. Yeah, yeah. So, no, I, you know, that's so I was, because I am a huge Dota 2 fan. I played a lot of League of Legends 2 before, but, uh, you know, Dota mm -hmm. 
Dota's the original game for me, and you know I like mm-hmm. Dota too. And but you know I'm definitely trying to improve in that game because I am just not good. Anyway, that's another subject. But um, you know, okay. for new players, uh, who, I you know it's a crazy thing, because I I feel like for a lot of players who've never hit I guess legend, let's just say legend as the goal, for players who have never hit mm-hmm. legend, um, sometimes they. <coughs> They miss, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Sometimes they misappropriate the the amount of games that they need to play mm-hmm. to uh, their actual skill level. Like, you know, sometimes people always make the excuse like, you know, I didn't hit Legend, I only hit Rank 5 or Rank 3 or whatever. But if I played another 50 games or if I played another 60 or 70 games or whatever, I would certainly have hit Legend. And I just didn't have enough time in the, in the month to grind that out. And then I, but, you know, I find that a lot of times, and this is even my own personal experience when before I first started even hitting Legend, was that I was making a lot of basic mistakes in the game that I thought were like the correct line of play, but were... You know, when someone better told me, they were like, yeah, no, this is clearly like the wrong line of play. And, you know, you're better off <laughs> doing something else. Like, what yeah. are what do you think are the three basic core common concepts that, uh, sp- you know, I guess newer players tend to make? And how can they improve on those mistakes? Mm-hmm. Okay. So when it comes to just gameplay, right? Like, we can skip for example things like not playing enough games and so on like you said so when it comes to just gameplay number one the most common mistake is playing too fast that's why people even can improve because they can actually figure out better plays if they just approach it in a better way if they sit for longer and look for the diff- for a different place and then think about them better that's number one mistake they play too fast right so they make mistakes that they even wouldn't have made if they just thought a little bit longer about the plays they make. Number two mistake that is uh, most common is not having like a long-term game plan for a matchup. Like Mm -hmm. for example, let's say you're playing like a hunter against warrior, right? Mm -hmm. And you have like a limited amount of damage because you're going to run out of card and you know that the damage you deal will be, let's say like 40 damage, right? And and your opponent is a warrior, so he's going to gain armor. So you need to like weave in hero powers, for example, as much as you can in order to maximize the damage. Or you need to like kill them before a certain time, right? You need to know the big picture plan so that you even you know how to start even thinking about your place, right? Mm-hmm. That's what people don't do as well. And that's something you can figure out like when you see your opponent's class pretty much, right? Yeah. Because you know the most popular deck, you know how you should start playing, right? That's like the number two mistake. I guess that's the most common. And number three mistake, I would say, is uh, saving cards too much, which means basically like saving cards for the rainy day, you know, like saving coin for the next game, like people sometimes Mm. say, or um, saving cards because they think like, um, for example, a good example of that is, uh, like you said about Mecha to decks, right? One of the most impressive plays I've ever seen is when I think it was Colento, Mm-hmm. He was playing a Mecha Toon deck and he was playing against a, a Zoo Warlock and he basically had to put down Mecha Toon. No, I, th- I think it was Strife Crow. He put down Mecha Toon just on board and used it as a minion to beat up the enemy and he won the game that way and that was the only way he could win. He just played Mecha Toon as a minion and beat up the enemy. Like nobody would do that because they're like, oh no, I, I need to save that for my combo, combo. in the end, right? Yeah, but, but actually the right play was to use it, yeah, because people forget like that their combo pieces are also cards that they can use now, and uh, rather than lose, you should use that card uh, and sacrifice the combo sometimes. Yeah. On that uh, on that mo- point, what what is your favorite archetype of all time uh, in Hearthstone, and what is what is what archetype do you dislike, and why? Mm-hmm. So my favorite archetype would be. I guess like a counter meta control, uh, which means a control deck that aims to to counter the meta game, right? So, if, for example, if the meta game is like right now, Hunter and Marlock Shaman Token Druid are like the popular decks. So then I guess 
like a control warrior would be and the deck here that I would favor in this meta game. The deck that I dislike the most, like the type of a deck, would be like big and like recruit decks that mm. cheat out huge minions early. Mm -hmm. Because it's like skewed con coin flip that isn't really attractive to me. Like, uh, like the old priest is... Um, mm -hmm the best example of the wild big priest with yeah. barns mm -hmm. because you have barns and like 33 percent of the games or something like 35 percent of the games you just win straight up and the rest is like okay we have a fair fight for for the rest of the games i guess but it's it's really unfunny like unfun to play against those decks no i, I totally understand that but i um i love those i well actually i don't like big priest but i like um like aviana kun type of druid decks you know like where you're ramping out like crazy stuff and you're dropping like 30 some mana or like hadronox uh you, do you remember master okart like master okart druid and then you pull out like hadronox and you pull out all this bullshit like or dragon yeah, hatcher the, oh my goodness yeah, that was... after the ramp was nerfed like it depends what turn that happens on yeah mm -hmm. but uh I mean, yeah. dude, like, I, I hit Legend in nine hours. Like, the start of the season, I just, you know, played that deck. Boom, nine hours. I was Legend. I was like, man, this is, uh, <laughs> yeah, it feels good nice. if you drop, like, 30-some mana on turn nine. You know, it's uh, it's it's uh, pretty crazy. Yes. Um, yep, it is good. <laughs> Recruit what? cards are some of the highest win rate cards in the game. Like, when played, it's crazy. Like, when you look at uh, the win rates on mm -hmm. some, on a website like um, HS Replay, HS Replay you can sort all of the cards in the game by their win rate when played. And of course, at first, you're going to have like Pyroblast, Leroy Jenkins, Savage Roar, all the finishers, because when they're played, of course, the game ends usually. But then you have like very surprising cards. And some of them were like, uh, you know, Jaina and Gul'dan Death Knights. But then there were like all the recruit cards, like the, the warrior weapon, uh, mm. the hunter legendary that recruits on Battlecry and Death Rattle and so on. And Master Oak card was like the, the highest win rate card. Wow. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about statistics and, you know, how sorting by a drawn win rate. Uh, when you coach, how, how much of the coaching session is actual in-game mechanics and how much of that is, um, I guess, deck optimization and studying uh, statistics? Or do you, do you teach uh, your students about those types of things? Yeah, but that's uh, that's like a supplementary thing. The main thing is gameplay and looking at the actual gameplay. So basically, like in the beginning of the session, we'd pick a deck and I just, you know, make sure that it's not a bad deck. Like if they have a preference to play that specific deck, fine, we can play with that. It's, 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 uh, it's all right as well. And then we would look at the statistics of, of what is good and so on. And for example, to know the matchups, uh, if the matchup is good or bad, you can you can easily check that. But then the main bulk of of coaching is, and I think should be, uh, gameplay, which is either during the game or if whenever possible, like whenever necessary, reviewing the replays because then like the person, the student has a chance to look at their own play from the outside, kind of, and see, mm -hmm. oh wait, that's actually kind of obvious, and and then you get to slowly explain to them okay why you should play that way rather than that way right that's the most important thing like figuring out the the reasoning behind certain plays so that they can replicate it and do it consistently you know one of the things that i find that can always be challenging is um when you lose a game they always tell you that you should look to see like what lines of play you could have made differently to alter the outcome in your favor but mm -hmm. how do you determine those situations where you just couldn't have won like you know you know what i mean like sometimes like I, i'll get I'll, I'll get hung up on the on something i'll mm -hmm. be like man you know man maybe i shouldn't have played this this turn or like did i have another line of play that could have kept me alive and then you know i'll just mull over a game that i lost but you know maybe the reality could be that you know there's just no chance i I just didn't mm -hmm. have the right yeah. trial, right? Exactly. So it's good to learn also recognizing. I always tell also people like, okay, this game, we had a really bad opening. Our opponent had a really good opening. We are supposed to lose here pretty much no matter what, right? And mm -hmm. sometimes that's the case. But even from these games, 
the aim should be okay we recognize that we couldn't have won but is there something still we could have done better like we would still lose but is there something to learn from this mm. game right because that's really that really should be the focus right like just focus on improving like one small thing each game and then you're gonna see improvement over time have you been uh, keeping an eye on the grandmaster format lately I've, I've seen an occasional game every now and then uh, and, and I knew you were going to ask about that so I checked like who is playing there actually as well mm -hmm. the, I, I mean the, what, what are your thoughts on the format I mean you know it's, it only allows 48 people in uh, you know it's mm -hmm. a pretty it's a pretty difficult barrier to entry um, mm -hmm. yeah like in a way for Hearthstone's popularity I feel like that's a great move because actually more people are watching Hearthstone after they've done that uh, which is great. Like they, they, they really figured out something that is interesting because you get to like associate a player with a class and it's more fun to watch, I guess. You have like a you know clash of different classes and, and uh, I like the format of this. Um, yeah. Cool. Seems cool. Um, you know what? Let's get into this deck list that you brought today. So... It looks like we got Token mm -hmm. Druid here, um, and I'm going to let you go ahead and, and, and just talk about it, like why you chose this particular list and, you know, why right. Token Druid fits well in this meta. Or... Yeah, yeah. So basically, I chose this list because if um, for the viewers, this should be like the easy deck, easy go-to deck, right? It's a very easy deck in multiple aspects. Like, number one, it has pretty much only Druid class cards plus the Archmage, right? There are changes you can make to the deck and different uh, neutral cards you can add, but you can just go with this, right? And uh, it deals well versus virtually anything. The hardest matchups would be like some very rare odd matchups. Like I've been doing fine against Zoo with this, but people say Zoo uh, is doing well against this. However, I, I don't see that. I'm, I'm like 50-50 versus Zoo. And Control Warrior, right? So Control Warrior is one deck that deals with it. However, I made a deck kind of in a way mm -hmm. to deal with Control Warrior if you play it correctly, right? Which playing correctly means like keeping the Keeper uh, for card risk for, for value, right? Uh, using Soul of the Forest appropriately and so on. Like That's the goal, right? Like trying to modify the deck a little bit so that you can actually beat control warriors right yeah and it's a very easy deck to pilot it's it's a it's a definitely a really good deck right now to, to ladder very simple when the um when the expansion first came out i played uh, i played this i played well i played token druid to legend uh as soon as the expansion came out um and it was strong i had a very similar build and i i had to play these force aids and tending torrents and i think i even played scenarios or something just because control warrior was like you know, it's a good yep. matchup yeah. versus Warrior, but then they started changing the Warrior deck to be, like, super, like, you got double Warpath, you got Brawl, you got, like, all this removal, like, AoE removal, and I was just like, man, mm -hmm. this matchup that used to be very winnable, like, now I have to tech in all these extra cards. Um, You know, I noticed there are no cards like Microtech Controller. Um, yep. Actually, yeah. you know what, let me just lead, let me read the list for these for people who don't have the list in, in front of them. We have two Acorn Bearer, two Crystal Song Portals, two Dreamway Guardians, one Keeper Stelladris, two Power of the Wild, two Wraths, two Blessing of the Ancients, two Landscaping, two Savage Roars, one Archmage Vargoth, uh, two Market Aloha, two Soul of the Forest, two Swipes, two Whispering Woods, two Tending, uh, or, yeah, Tending Tauren, and two Forest Aid. Um, do you think you can talk a little bit about how you approach um, maybe the aggro matchups and how you approach the control warrior matchup in general? Maybe like how do you deal with mm -hmm. Ma uh, Zoo and Murloc and how do you deal with control warrior based on a mulligan okay. and the strategy, I guess? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, for, yeah, I can talk about like the most popular decks. So, for example, against uh, like Murloc Shaman, things like that, right? Against other token decks. Uh, you're definitely looking for the the early game minions. Like you're looking, you're looking for the Acorn Bear. You're looking for the Guardians, Power of the Wild, Wrath, uh, Landscaping. Right. You're looking for stuff to develop early on, and also for the removal. 
um, especially against like a hunter. Like if you see a hunter, definitely you're keeping wrath swipe. You need that removal to make sure that if you also put something on the board, you have other things to remove their stuff, preventing the magnetic minions from being attached to something. And that will do, that will help you win. Like if you get through the early game against those decks, you're gonna be fine because you're gonna outlast them. You're gonna have like a strong turn where you get to develop a lot of minions. You're gonna have like whispering woods turns. You're gonna have uh, turns where you can buff your minions and so on. But the early game is the most important. So definitely heavily mulligan for uh, anything three and below that you can develop against these aggressive matchups. Same against rogue, for example. Against warrior, um, or depends, like maybe against priest, like you need to know what you can get away with, right? That's the general principle for Mulligan. Like against warrior, you know, you definitely don't need the uh, like low impact cards, low value cards, but you need the big impact cards, right? So you definitely need like Whispering Woods. You could potentially keep the Tending Torrent, the Forest Aid, and so on, because whether you have a one drop or not doesn't really matter. Whether you have a two drop or not doesn't really matter. But what matters is like how many times you can make a big board by like turn 10, for example, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and if you can just keep making that big board over and over, eventually they're going to run removal, right? Recently, I had a game where I played against uh, exactly Control Warrior and uh, he had uh, Warpath, Warpath and Brawl, like all of those in the top. 14 cards of his deck so you know kind of above average even though they're gonna mulligan and keep those cards always like you'd only expect like two of them yeah. like max three of them right mm -hmm. so they had a great hand but they still couldn't deal with the amount of uh, of of board minions field. that were just being developed on the board over and over how do so how about um like choose with like power of power of the wild like what Mm -hmm. When are you playing that as a 3-2 on turn 2? Or how often are you saving that to combo with something like Whispering Woods or Force Aid? Mm -hmm. like, well, yeah. How do you make that decision, I'll, I guess? Mm -hmm. So you make that decision based on uh, the matchup, of course. And let's say you're playing against a Hunter. It's the best on examples, right, to explain that. Uh, let's say you're playing against a Hunter. You know that they're going to play a minion early on right most likely or a secret and if you don't kill that minion he's gonna deal damage to you and you definitely don't want to take extra damage against a uh, hunter and if they're gonna be playing early minions then that means when you play your whatever landscaping or, or something you I'm play something for three mana four mana they're gonna clear it right so you're not gonna be able to buff your minions so that means okay you should use the power of the wild as a minion in that case right uh, but if you're playing against a uh, slow deck, and uh, if, especially if you have other options, right? Like if you if the board is empty, and you're playing against like a mid-range deck or something, like something that is not not uh, important to do one way or the other, you would rather develop the Dreamway Guardians, for example, right? Then play Power of the Wild because then you can also play another minion and buff it and so on. You keep the options, right? You want to think of like which card is better in my hand, which card is better on the board, and, and do it that way. Um, with Archmage Vargoth, what are mm -hmm. the typical power turns with that card? Like, well, what do you usually want to play that card in conjunction with? Mm -hmm. Usually, you want to play it with, like, in a turn that you play one other uh, spell. So it's great with something like uh, Soul of the Forest, for example. It's great with Swipe, actually. Uh, it's great with Blessing of the Ancients. With Twin Spells, uh, it actually gives you the the additional spell that you're supposed to get if you're oh, casting the first Oh, shit. Bird. Wow, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, so you yeah. get double so extra why... spells. Exactly, exactly. Oh. If you, yeah, sometimes I do that, like have Archmage and then next turn I just cast the Blessing of the Ancients and nothing else. Mm. And then I get, of course, the Twin Spell from it. And then after Archmage casts it, you also get a Twin Spell. So you get kind of like four of them. Wow. That's why it's a really good card in this deck. And also it's pretty likely to survive. Against Warrior, the only thing they have usually to remove it um, is if they have something on the board and they have the... The five five rush militia whatever mm -hmm. the militia minion. Uh, 
like I had a, I had a game like my opponent played the militia I'm like okay now the only thing they can do to remove this is another militia and of course they had it uh. But, uh, but that's the only way they can usually remove it and if this if it sticks then you can buff it you can do so many things with it yeah so crystal song portal how often is that card grabbing you three creatures and how often is it just one card value looking for some utility very very rarely it's just one card oh okay. very rarely like i would have to really be desperate for a card to have to use it uh with one so because i'm assuming usually, oh go ahead sorry mm-hmm. i'm assuming that's because a card usually you, never you will keep. have just mostly spells in your hand and uh, the minions that you have are easy to play like tending torrent is the hardest minion to to get out of your hand but you don't have them often in your hand because you don't mulligan for them, right? Mm. Uh, like again, unless you're playing against a warrior and want to keep it because you also have the early game. Uh, so almost every like ninety percent, you get three minions from it very easily. Great, amazing. Um, any are there any typical lines of play that new players commonly make with the deck, but you think is probably a mistake, and they should kind of unlearn that habit? Mm-hmm. So it's probably blindly just buffing the board because you have to account for the removal and the type of removal people have like for example let's let's say you're playing into warrior and you should have a good read on what is the amount of minions that he wants to brawl right basically think of it this way if you have like let's say three minions and what amount of the of attack you would have to have on the board for the warrior to feel really uncomfortable doing nothing this turn because that's basically usually what it comes down to like either he does nothing or he does brawl because if he plays a minion you're gonna remove it so easy and not lose anything and develop even bigger board uh so so it's better for him to brawl unless he can just wait to just armor up and something and just tank the damage and make you commit more resources so you have to kind of have a good feel for the other side of the matchup as well and if you know the brawl is coming, or if you know the brawl might be coming, you don't want to buff your minions. You just want to have him remove them, and you because you would have lost the buff for no reason, right? Just to deal three damage or four damage. Not okay. worth it if you can actually make it matter uh, next time you develop a board. Yeah. So like blindly just using buffs. Okay, I see. I see. Um, what? What are some of the, I guess, like, what's the 29th and 30th card in the deck? Like, if you want to flex this out, like, you're not you're not facing a bunch of control warrior, but you want to, I don't know, work against another matchup. What, what, what are the two cards that you'd take out, I guess, first? Mm-hmm. So you would probably remove something like Soul of the Forest, like one of the Soul of the Forest and one Tending Torrent, I guess. Like one Soul, one Tending Torrent. Uh, and then you can get something for the early game, right? You can get the Microtech controller, for example. That's a good card as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can get, I guess, some kind of decent uh, one drop uh, or two drop, something for the early game. You would, you would look for. Yeah. Oh, have you have you tried Warlord Lodi or whatever his name is? The three drop. Legendary. Uh, I haven't drop? tried it. it. Should be all right as well because you can make it like. One five or something, right? Yeah, taunt. So it's yeah, taunt, yeah, and it sticks to the board. It should be all right. I don't think it particularly fits the deck mm-hmm. uh, because you'd you'd much rather like the Microtech controller is a way better card for this deck, right? Uh, because you can buff it with Soul of the Forest, you can buff it with all the things, and like the more bodies you have on the board from one minion, the better. Another good card is also. Uh, where is it? That five mana minion that summons like, or four mana that summons amalgamations as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Hench Clan Hag the or hen- something. Yeah, yeah. Hench Clan mm-hmm. Hag, exactly. That's another good minion for this deck, right? If if you can play one minion and develop three bodies to the board, probably a very good minion for the deck. I see, I see. Hey man, you know this is awesome. I I, I it was a pleasure having you on the show. Is there anything you want to say to viewers at home, or maybe you can provide them with the information on? How they can contact you for coaching? Do you coach on Game Leap or how do you? Or yeah, I have a profile on Gamer Sensei mm. uh, Asmodeus. You can find the link uh, in my YouTube video descriptions. So basically, you can find me on YouTube at Asmodeus Clips and on Twitter at Asmodeus Tweets and on Twitch at Asmodeus Stream. Very easy names. 
Uh, and on Twitter, like I always post whenever there is a new video out, whenever I stream and so on. So Twitter is the best place to follow. Yeah. Thank you so much, man. Thank you so much for tuning in on stream. Uh, those of you home, make sure you give them a follow on those different social channels. Uh, still has got great content. It's a great learning experience, especially if you want to learn how to play combo. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I, I know I'm fanboying right now, man, because I just really feel like, you know, <laughs> We, you know, when you, I watched like a couple of your YouTube videos where you kind of explain Mechaton Priest and how the flow of the turns work and, you know, um, how you're spending like turns seven through nine or whatever to make sure that you dump your cards so that when you hit 10, you only have the combo cards in hand or that you're spending the final few turns only on board wipes so that, you know, you can just basically time walk into your final combo turn mm -hmm. and i you know i i really think it's a huge huge uh uh help i you know that definitely made me not only a better mechathun priest player but a, a definitely better combo player in general especially with like uh, newer decks like the nomi priest and things of that nature but uh, yeah yeah I, I, was, I was coaching recently nomi priest it, it was very interesting because it mm -hmm. plays fairly similarly and we were just destroying the ladder so the student was very happy dude i think nomi priest is still pretty good like i you know i will as long yeah, as you don't queue yeah. into bomb warrior but i you know uh but uh, we beat warrior as well yeah it's, it's, it's not uh, it really depends how quickly you can cycle it but definitely doable especially if you like force a brawl like try to force a brawl before nomi and then you're, you're then you're good yeah awesome man thank you so much Guys, stay tuned. Next week, we have another guy, a uh, couple of other guests on the show. Uh, and like always, make sure you follow Asmodeus and all his channels. And we will see you next time.